Good evening. I'm Dr. Max Gomez. I am the senior medical correspondent for CBS here in New York. And it is my pleasure uh, again to moderate this webinar. And tonight's topic is another very interesting and important one. And I'm sure that we will uh, actually, all of us will learn quite a bit from this. What physicians should know about inflammatory bowel disease and liver disease in children. And we will cover certain things that uh, I think are very unique uh, to Columbia Children's Hospital. Uh, we have a distinguished panel here and to introduce them, please. Oh, before we do that, let me remind you that the, this entire webinar is being recorded and it will be available or in a day or so uh, on the Columbia Children's website and YouTube channel. So you don't have to take notes and there won't be a quiz later. Uh, you can actually uh, get to it uh, tomorrow on, on YouTube. And if you don't know how to get to there, ask your 10 year old, they'll tell you how to get there, okay? Uh, and to introduce our distinguished panel, uh, please uh, welcome Dr. Ali Menson, the Chief of the Division of Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology and Nutrition. And there were some more titles that went along with that, Ali. Uh, but I think we'll leave that alone. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, that's that's fine, Max. It's uh, we're not here for me tonight. So it's uh, thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here to introduce our panelists for our discussion on IBD and liver disease and the interplay between the two. Uh, we're very fortunate at Columbia to have amazing programs in both IBD and hepatology. Um, our first panelist is Dr. Neil Lalaiko. Uh, who's a professor of pediatrics and the director of the pediatric IBD program at Columbia and Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital. He's both an MD and a PhD, has served as division director uh, of gastroenterology at both Brown and at Mount Sinai. Uh, he's not only an outstanding and experienced clinician, but has published extensively on IBD. Uh, our second panelist is Dr. Joseph Picararo. Uh, he is the Associate Director of our Pediatric IBD Program, and he's the Director of our GI Inpatient Services. He's also the lead for infusion therapy for IBD. Uh, his particular interest is in interventional endoscopic techniques for the management of IBD. Uh, welcome, Joe. Um, Steven Labrito uh, is our third panelist. He's the pr a Professor of Pediatrics and the Medical Director of Pediatric Liver Transplantation. He's also the director of the Pediatric Advanced Transplant Hepatology Fellowship at Columbia. Uh, he's not only an outstanding clinician, but he has uh, grown our liver transplant service to one of the lead centers in the region, uh, which performs more transplants than any other center. And uh, our final panelist is uh, Dr. Mercedes Martinez. She's also a professor of pediatrics, and uh, she is a uh, not only renowned transplant hepatologist, but she's the medical director of the adult and pediatric intestinal and multivisceral transplantation uh, program. Um, I'd also like to add that she was my co-fellow during our fellowship training here at Columbia. Um, so uh, welcome uh, everyone and welcome Mercedes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ali. And uh, I may say that I've asked uh, beforehand for permission from our panelists to address them by their first name. So I'm not being uh, disrespectful. It just makes it a little easier. And I think uh, humanizes them uh, a, a little more than they might uh, otherwise be. So let's, let's get started here. And um, I think I'll toss this out uh, in general to any of you that uh, wanna jump in on that. Let's start at the beginning a little bit so that we're all kind of on the same page. Um, what is exactly inflammatory bowel disease, particularly uh, inflammatory bowel disease in children, and what are some of the different types that we're talking about here? Who wants to grab that one first? Well, I think well, that, that, that feels like it's thrown my direction and I'm happy to catch it. Um, inflammatory bowel disease has had various, people have taken various views of it in the course of my own career, which has spanned uh, some 40 years. Uh, we always think historically of Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis and uh, as distinct diseases. What we have learned over the course of the last decades and more recently even in the last few years is that these are highly individualized diseases. Um, they're very personalized, each individual is somewhat different and they're probably best thought of not, well, there's no doubt in my mind that down the road, five, 10, 15 years from now, rather than 
referring to them as Crohn's and colitis. We'll be thinking of them as immune-mediated inflammatory diseases, um, uh, and we'll combine them with juvenile rheumatoid arthritis or juvenile immune arthritis, uh, psoriasis, things along those lines. Um, and there are similarities because of the immune responses of each individual to various things in our environment. Um, each case, as I say, is individualized. And while many diseases have ebbed in the pediatric world, we've seen between a three and a four times increase in the incidence of this disease, which certainly invokes the environment since our genetics hasn't changed. And I think I'll, I'll stop there and leave it for the others to comment because um, everything that I've said impacts everybody, all the other panelists and how they view their diseases. And you'll see the commonalities, I think, as we go on. Very good. Thank you, Neil. You mentioned a couple of uh, different diseases that seem to overlap. Is, then, is it fair then to think of IBD as part of the so-called ectopic march, that this is all, we're seeing increases in everything from, I guess, uh, uh, psoriasis, uh, food allergies, and all sorts of other allergies uh, there. Overlap, it's part of this, uh, this bigger picture. Yeah. Yes, I think that what I think that the diseases that have increased substantially all have the similarity and the and incriminate the environment very heavily in terms of what's going on. And we see, for example, in that part of the environment we have more control. Our diets, presumably, we have more control over our diets. We see that as individualized from developing areas adapt Western diets. Um, the increase in the disease in, in our intestinal diseases has become much more marked. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's concerning, but it also is illuminating and is opening up new doors as we talk about such things as you'll, I'm sure you'll hear the word microbiome if, you know, many, many, many times. And um, we'll cover that, I'm sure we'll cover that tonight uh, in various situations. But it all, it, the increase over the last decade or two has to incriminate the environment. And um, my expertise historically has been the nutrition. Uh, and therefore, when we talk about environment, and we talk about the GI tract, it's another shorthand way of saying, hey, what you eat, the intestinal environment is your diet. Other things impact it, antibiotics and other things. Um, but most of what you read today is intriguing, but it's going to look very um, infantile 10 years from now. The, the rate of progress in this area is so rapid that um, I, you know, I, I wouldn't want anyone 10 years from now looking back to how we, to our state of so-called state of the art literature now, it will look pretty primitive. Yeah, fair enough. Let me ask um, and, and see if one of, one of our other panelists might want to take this on because whenever we talk about environment, we usually think of the environment interacting with some sort of a pre genetic predisposition that the environment provides the trigger to something that is already there. Um, that sounds like so maybe we can control some of the environment, but I suspect we can't do very much about our genetics. We can't pick our parents. Um, do any of you want to what, what, yeah. take what do we do about the genetics uh, component? Yeah. Max, I can jump on that. So um, to follow through, um, you talked about the atopic march. And I, I want to make clear that um, one of the really exciting areas of gastroenterology and thinking about um, how our gastrointestinal system um, is involved in immune processes. You know, it's fascinating. The gastrointestinal system is actually the largest immune organ. And I know Mercedes can speak to that when it comes to the complexity of transplanting a new intestine um, into somebody. Um, there is uh, a rich interplay between what's going on in the environment uh, and the intestinal tract. And when we're talking about um, it, sort of in not exactly layman's terms, but we're thinking about allergic diseases. So you talked about the atopic march, uh, eczema, food allergies, uh, to some degree, reactive airways disease, asthma. Um, this all um, connects to a set of gastrointestinal diseases that involve, involve a part of the immune system related to the eosinophil, um, so eosinophilic diseases. And that is actually somewhat distinct uh, from inflammatory bowel disease um, and some of the 
um, immune dysregulation that occurs within inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, but there is overlap. So this eosinophil, which is one part of the immune system, we're actually um, seeing an emerging role for it um, in the, the pathophysiology of inflammatory bowel disease. And where we've made great advances in understanding this underlying uh, physiology actually is in the genetics. So what is um, really important within children um, and uh, the, longer, the younger you are, um, the, the more um, the chances that genetics influence um, uh, your uh, development of something like inflammatory bowel disease. Um, we've been able to identify the specific molecular mechanisms that cause IBD in some forms, um, especially in younger children. Um, and so inflammatory bowel disease actually is a, um, a great example of that spectrum of the genetics can be almost the entire story when you're very young. Um, so in some children, they're diagnosed under a year of age, and it's almost all genetics. Um, and then older on, in a lot of adults that develop inflammatory bowel disease, they have risk. There is some genetic contribution, um, but it's more so the environmental factors that then trigger you into the cascade of the immune dysregulation. Interesting. I neglected to uh, mention earlier, which I should have, uh, if any of our viewers uh, this evening have a question, you can enter them in the Q&A box or in the chat box there at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and I will try to uh, integrate it into uh, our, our Q&A in here. Um, so we've mentioned a few different kind of overlapping things here, gastroenterology, nutrition, immunology, uh, genetics. How important is it to have a team approach then in managing IBD in kids? Uh, Mercedes, I think uh, you were you were kind of teed up there by Joe a little bit. You want to take that one? Well, I'm not an IBD expert. Um, I can talk a little bit about the importance of a team approach to take care of all these patients, not just the IBD patient, but all these patients with multiple and complex uh, conditions like a liver disease, intestinal uh, failure, intestinal transplant. Um, I think that the thin approach here is critical. These uh, patients that have complex disease don't have only one problem. They have several problems. They have nutritional problems. They have immunological problems. They have definitely gastrointestinal problems. Also, they have developmental problems, social problems. It is very complex. And I really think that um, this is one of those um, conditions that needs to be approached like a, maybe a team. This is uh, like, imagine a baseball uh, team. Eh? Each one of us has a very important role. And if we don't play together, we don't bring the patient to the home base. And I really think that this is extremely important that people recognize that team approach is critical and it cannot be done in a silo or isolated. This is a very, very important um, uh, approach. Right, and uh, Ali uh, assured me that you guys all play together in the same sandbox very, very well. Can, uh, I, can I add that to that, Max? Absolutely, please do. So I think, you know, Mercedes had mentioned a number of the teams involved. You know, the IBD, again, I'm not the IBD specialist. The IBD often involves, uh, it has a surgical approach. Certainly there's a lot of pharmacological interventions. So involvement of PharmD is critical. Uh, Mercedes mentioned a nutritionist. Uh, certainly these patients have a lot of psychosocial issues. So having psychological support for someone with chronic liver disease, for chronic disease whether it be bowel, liver, or both. You know, so I think it's really it's such a multifaceted that affects so many parts of the patient that you better have a team that integrates well, you know, that uh, to get the best result. Let's take kind of a, a half step back then and talk about what are the what are some of the signs and symptoms of IBD in, in children and and when should a parent or or a, um, a pediatrician uh, start to worry about a child potentially having IBD. Well, you know, it's very interesting as we talk and spend a lot of time at the cutting edge looking at the immunologic interactions, um, uh, how important they are. From a clinical perspective, part of the picture is really basic pediatrics as it has been taught for half a century or a century. And so from the pediatric point of view, 
Um, it's important to engage the patient, find out how the child is doing. And it's very basic things, um, growth, growth and physical development for the older kids entering into puberty. Um, uh, very, 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 very important. Sometimes the very, very first symptom is growth failure. And we see children who have their growth level off on the growth curve before they develop any other symptoms. Um, so our endocrinologists from time to time are the ones who are making the diagnosis. Uh, but it's very, very important. Um, lack of drop in school grades, uh, lack of interest. Some kids are very stoic and don't think they're talking about, you know, about somewhere is between, it's quoted between 15 and 30% of school age children have a chronic abdominal pain of one sort or another at some point. And it's uh, for many parents and teachers and others, you tend to look at the child from belly ache and say, oh, come on, you know, man up if you're a boy or, you know, you know, make somebody feel badly about discussing it. Um, so there are a lot of kids who come to pa whose disease presents later. Uh, and so belly aches, diarrhea, blood, obviously are the obvious things, but growth failure, uh, skin disorders. Uh, you know, we see some kids who develop psoriasis or other unusual skin issues. Uh, very, very important. And um, um, so I think diet, we see kids nowadays who have been put on every imaginable diet because it's assumed that the belly aches are related to some food they eat uh, that can delay diagnosis. Mm. Joe, you want to comment? Because I'm sure I left out a few things. Right. And then also when, Ali, maybe that's for you. When, when should someone, when should a parent be worried about a child uh, if, if such a large proportion of kids have at some point or another chronic abdominal pain? Um, when do they start worrying about being worked up for that. I bet you sort of question. I think uh, oh, uh, I was going to say um, they're always they're always worried about it, and you know that's the job of the parent to be worried about it. Luckily, in most patients with abdominal pain, upwards of more than ninety five percent, there isn't anything going on. It's just functional abdominal pain. However, if the pain is ongoing or it's worsening or it's accompanied by some of these other symptoms like vomiting or bloody diarrhea or growth failure, then those are, uh, you know, um, those highlight the need to uh, get further evaluation follow-up. So I've, in, in uh, some of the things that I've done a lot in the past is being, been involved with the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation. And a lot of the uh, uh, children who I met through that uh, had had some kind, some surgery uh, uh, as a result of their inflammatory bowel disease. Um, when, when do children need surgery and is, and is that avoidable? Okay, well, that's a very, very important question because when it comes to Crohn's disease, I'm talking about Crohn's as distinct from ulcerative colitis, we now consider Crohn's disease to be an aggressive, persistent disease that if it's neglected will progress and cause damage. And uh, when we look at the, there, there are numerous papers that have been published and you can take, and each has a different sort of looking at the elephant, you know, from different directions, but it's clear that it's clear to me that for many of our kids early, and I hate to use the word, I used to use the word aggressive. I would say early aggressive therapy is critical. Now I've changed the term on my slides when I give talks to early appropriate therapy. I don't want to sound aggressive because it's not aggressive anymore. Early appropriate therapy and that's why time is so important. When we look at large scale studies, uh, first of all, for pediatrics, if we talk about 10 years, there are very few papers that have been written on that. We wrote a paper on 10 year history from one of our early uh, studies. And it was at a time when newer therapies were coming on board. And it appeared, and now experience supports, that many of the new biological agents what we call biological agents, and we can expand on that if you wish, um, are very effective and delay the complications. They delay the progress of disease. Uh, sadly, parents are scared of some of the new stuff. I never fully understood it, but with what we're going through with um, uh, anti-vaxxers and, 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 and COVID, um, it enlightens me to the fact that some people are just afraid of new things and don't trust science, and that's a whole other area, which I'm sure everybody has to deal with in their own way. But we have effective medications, and our doctors, our GI doctors, and our parents have to learn to use those different tools, those medicines early and effectively. And then we can postpone or put off forever surgery. How effective 
there are numbers that are not um, adequate, but I think all of us who see uh, huge numbers of IBD patients feel strongly about this. Mm -hmm. Joe, you want to put a I comment can jump on that, Max, to echo what Neil is saying? Um, early appropriate therapy is absolutely what is essential. And, um, you know, we take a very um, uh, careful um, approach with our families and making good decisions about what treatment plan is going to be the best for their child. Um, and um, that decision-making process happens at, at multiple levels, and we in include the child to the degree that they're developmentally appropriate um, in that discussion, because this is, this is a lifelong disease. Some of these treatment decisions that we're making early on um, are going to have implications for, for what their life is like as adults. And in this, um, one of the, the humbling aspects of inflammatory bowel disease is even with all of the advances that we've had, we have much better medications now that are much safer and much more effective. Um, some children um, still need surgery, and surgery is absolutely the right thing to do for their disease in the right time. And the best way for us to have that surgery be successful and be appropriate for the disease process is early therapy to get the disease into the best place that it can be. So although the data is showing us that there are some kids that still need surgery and it's still an important role, you absolutely want a multidisciplinary approach where you have an intensive um, gastroenterologist um, looking at the medicine and working closely with the surgeons to make sure the timing and the use of surgery is appropriate. Let me add, what a great, I'm sorry. What right. I was going to say is that one of the things that every person, every GI doctor, pediatric GI doctor that ever gave a lecture to used to talk about a triangle with basic treatments down here. And then if that didn't work, you went to the next level and the next level and the next level. And at the very top, like a giant cloud was the word surgery. And it was made to people to think, oh, everything, no matter what, you got to avoid surgery. It's terrible. It's horrible. It's well, everybody wants to avoid it, but it is a treatment that has to be used like the other treatments when it's appropriate. And, um, uh, and we try to do a, make a judgment. What's in the patient, what's the benefits and what are the risks? No different than almost any other disease. And I think that risk benefit has now shifted towards these early effective treatments that we have, largely biological agents, and when necessary, when necessary, when appropriate, so expert surgical intervention. I'll leave it at that. I want to add a little bit to that. Uh, and I think that the, um, about a decade ago, Crohn's disease was one of, one of the top indications for intestinal transplantation in young adults and some kids, when maybe the medication was not appropriate. But I really think that appropriate therapy, early therapy is a key. And when the surgery is needed, it should be really approached by experts. Um, you can go in and maybe resect more bowel that is needed. And sometimes these patients need more than one surgery. And when you start bringing the patient back and cutting the intestine again, sometimes patients going into short bowel syndrome and requiring parenteral nutrition at the end, requiring intestinal transplant. Then it's just this early appropriate therapy, aggressive medical therapy is a key for here. So can I represent my surgical colleagues for that? So my, my answer for this- You've been awfully quiet over there. So my answer for this would be that surgery is reserved for complications of the disease like abscesses and things that occur, strictures that occur that uh, may not respond well and medical refractory disease. So luckily that there's so many new therapies that there's not as common that there's medical refractory disease that surgery is not is not necessary, but I think you know, certainly some people, you know, that you can only do so much with medications and then we have to, you know, consider surgery. Certainly since Mercedes and I are transplanters, removing the bowel and starting from scratch has a certain uh, appeal to it, but uh, certainly that needs to be uh, uh, used with some judgment. Well, let's, let's talk about how IBD interacts with liver disease, which then can uh, sometimes take us into, into transplantation. Um, Let's talk about liver disease and, and what, what's the impact or the interaction between liver disease and, and IBD in kids? Well, um, can I? Oh, go ahead. Can I? Okay. Yeah, I think that um, it's very well established that the microbiome is very connected to the liver and to, with a bile flow and um, bile elastics development. But for us clinicians, I think that uh, the key is um, a condition, the most 
I think that the closest association is a condition called primary sclerosis cholangitis or PSC. Um, about 15% of patients with IBD will go to develop PSC and about 85% of the patients with PSC have IBD or will eventually develop IBD. Then I think that this is maybe the closest association to the point that we recommend that every patient that has IBD get a screen once in a while for liver disease. And as a liver specialist, every patient that I diagnose with PSC, I screen for IBD. And many times the screening goes to the point to endoscopy because a patient with PSC they can have IBD with minimal clinical manifestations. This has been well described. Uh, we just published a very large series of patients with IBD, more than a thousand, and they, we publish about this kind of uh, lack of clinical symptoms on patients with IBD that we go and do the endoscopy and they have terrible colitis. And then it's important to think about that association. Okay, does that then uh, does that then lead to liver transplantation or uh, what about liver transplantation and intestinal transplantation overlap? Uh, what, what, what's what's the story? Well, there? well um, the PSC is one of those diseases that rarely progress to to transplantation in pediatric patients. This um, the, the progression of this disease is very um, heterogeneous. Some patients, I see patients with 12, 15 years old that need a transplant, but there are patients that can be followed 20, 40, 50 years and never need a transplant. They might develop cirrhosis, they might not. And when the liver disease progresses to the point of end stage liver disease, they will require liver transplantation. This is for the PSC part. For the IBD part, as I explained before, some patients, if they develop um, significant complications and they require recurrent surgery, they might develop uh, intestinal failure. This is how the clinical definition of, uh, of patients that will require uh, intestinal transplant. And, and if they develop intestinal failure or they, that is characterized mainly by malabsorption, diarrhea, fluid intolerance, um, vitamin deficiencies, poor growth, then we can give parenteral nutrition to those patients. But when those patients develop complications due to the parenteral nutrition, then is when they will need intestinal transplant. And there is no very tight connection between these two things, but it could be that they eventually might develop short bowel and require intestinal transplant. I would, I would add, um, at the very beginning, I commented that Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, the better term might be immune-mediated inflammatory diseases. And that's sort of the joining point of what Mercedes is talking about. And of course, one of the things at a center like Columbia, uh, we get the sickest and the weirdest and the most complex and complicated. So from Mercedes' point of view, that's our bread and butter. From our point of view, um, even though we see a tremendous number of complex patients with inflammatory bowel disease, um, the issues of primary sclerosis and cholangitis and those things that lead to liver transplant are a distinct minority of patients. Uh, and um, so far, since I've been here in the, just a couple of years I've been here, we've had some pretty good success with trying to manage some of those patients, um, but it's always a challenge. And I'll just jump in. I saw the question, I think, that Ali answered in the, um, the chat feature. When we talk about this multidisciplinary care, um, you know, it's happening at multiple levels. So when we have a child who has a complex uh, disease or goes into a phase of complexity, um, the, um, as you can see with our close collegiality on this, this webinar, you know, um, uh, Mercedes and Steve and I all share some very complex patients and we're constantly talking with each other about what the next step is going to be in the, in the care of that patient. And so, um, you know, the burden is definitely on us um, as the, the care team that's trying to sort through what's going to be the next best step uh, for your child, uh, for um, the child, for the patient. Um, and um, being at a, a place like Columbia really allows us to do that in real time in an actionable way. I'd also like to add one other thing to that, which is that we're not only interacting with the other pediatric subspecialists, but we also interact with some of our adult colleagues as well. And uh, 
you know, Joe works very closely with adult interventional endoscopy. And, uh, you know, we were talking about surgery for the treatment of inflammatory bowel disease. Well, sometimes surgery can be avoided through interventional endoscopic techniques for, our, you know, uh, relieving stricture, for example, and then you can avoid surgery altogether. And those kind of innovative techniques are usually more available to the uh, adult services, but because we work so closely with them here at Columbia, I think uh, we can offer those services to many of our children, which is wonderful. If I can add to that, it's, it's not just GI related to GI. You know, certainly we use uh, interventional radiology, radiology, pathology, you know, really tests every facet of the hospital to support a patient uh, with these complex diseases. Can I talk a little bit about there's other overlaps between our luminal colleagues and the, and the liver, you know. So mm -hmm. a lot of the medications that are used to treat these disorders can unfortunately have an adverse effect on the liver. You know, some of these medications and or complications of the disease can cause infectious processes that affect the liver. Certainly malnutrition in other ways can cause fatty liver and changes in the liver along those lines. Um, you know, patients who have issues often develop biliary disease that's distinct from PSC. You know, they other like stones in the in the in, uh, in the gallbladder, stones in the biliary system. You know, and uh, there are certain diseases that we take care of predominantly, like glycogen storage disease type one B, which has an IBD-like illness that's uh, that's associated with uh, cyclic neutropenia. And it's one of the IBD illnesses that can respond to GCSF, the stimulation of, a, of neutrophil production. So we overlap a lot. It's like, you know, we like to make all these compartmentalizations that, you know, we take care of this and you take care of that. But, uh, you know, there's, so, there's a lot of overlap and it's, and it's necessary. Yeah, I'd like to just, you know, it suddenly dawns on me that we've been throwing around some terms that people may not be that familiar with. Mercedes and Steve and the team and the group are seeing a lot of patients with complex, serious illness, and many of these are patients where the origins of their dreadful complications are 10 and 15 years old. Um, and so, when I so I want to go back and say something about the treatments. Historically, one of the big advances in treatments was the use of immunosuppressive agents, methotrexate, well, azathioprine at 6MP, and then methotrexate, um, and they, they tended to replace steroids and 5-ASA drugs like sulfasalazine and, and, and mesalamine. Uh, those drugs were very effective around the 1990s, early part of the, the century. Uh, and, but when they failed, towards the end of 19, uh, 1997, 1998, infliximab, or an anti-TNF agent, was developed. And that was an intravenous agent that finally became available to our children around 2006, 2007. That has changed that when we talk about biological agents, we're talking about that as the first of a whole new range, a whole new era in the treatment of these diseases. Sadly, the first patients on those biological agents all had already been on all these other agents and developed, some developed cancer, some developed other bad things, which were word of mouth spread well. My child just went on, or a patient just went on infliximab a year ago, and now this is happening. And it's taken a while to overcome and to see the, with some clarity that most of the worst complications were related to that earlier medications. And as we've come to use these newer agents alone by themselves, we have seen much better outcomes, much fewer side effects. And so we have infliximab, which, uh, adalimumab, which is, infliximab, which is an IV drug, adalimumab, which is an injectable every two weeks or one week, that's Umira and uh, Vitalizuma, and now we're coming to other meds that are not available to our children under 18, which is a whole other story, very whole other story. But we can occasionally get permission to use them when, these, when, we, uh, when our regular drugs are fail. And so we have Vitalizumab, which works totally differently, and Ustakinumab, and these are the drug names. There are some fancy brand names that go along with them. And all sorts of new things that are coming on the horizon. And they will have to be vetted to see how effective they are, and then we'll see the long-term outcomes. But the trajectory of where this disease was 30 years ago, where it has come and how it, what its future is, is very heartening. And I think that there's every reason to be optimistic about the future of the children who we're diagnosing. So uh, the, the medical management as it gets uh, better and better means potentially fewer and fewer children end up in uh, 
Stephen and Mercedes Clinic? Oh, absolutely. Want to avoid, want to keep away from Stephen Mercedes. Not nice people. Up. Bad, bad, bad. Don't like that. <laughs> Steve, let me come back to you with a, with a question here because if a, a child then ends up, uh, has failed medical management um, and may become a, uh, a candidate for be it liver or, or intestinal transplant, I think the question that parents are always going to ask are the sort of nuts and bolts, uh, you know, how frequently uh, are you doing this? How long do you have to wait? Does a child uh, normally wait for um, uh, a, a liver or intestinal transplant, living versus uh, cadaveric uh, donation, those sorts of things? Um, can you tackle some of that? Sure. So for liver, you know, we're very aggressive at getting livers for our patients. You know, recently the allocation system has changed in this country where um, it used to be that we only could pull cadaveric livers for deceased donor livers from our own region, Region 9, which is New York and a piece of Vermont. But now they've created consensual circles around the donor hospital, giving priority to the patients that fall within these, within these circles to the transplant centers. Um, living donation has made it so that we have the possibility of a parent or, or someone with the best interest in the patient to donate a piece of the liver. We do that with uh, incredible expertise. We have uh, Dr. Iman and Dr. Cato, uh, one of our, Dr. Iman was one of the innovators of living donation in this country uh, 32, 33 years ago. Um, so, uh, you know, we're very aggressive getting organs. Intestinal transplant, you know, fitting in and, or multivisceral transplant, which, so it seems multivisceral transplant where you change not only the intestine, but the liver, part of the stomach, part of the colon, and part of the pancreas, you know, um, for all of those organs to fit into someone, certainly you can't do living donation for that because that would be murder. So uh, you don't do that. So, uh, but uh, you know, uh, transplanting these things in, it's, it becomes complex, but at the same time, the organs seem to protect each other. The liver to protect the bowel to some extent and make it easier to manage some of these patients uh, with multivisceral. So um, to answer your question that we've had nobody die or very i can remember one patient in the last 10 years that died waiting on the list you know the center is very aggressive we never pass an organ uh pass on an organ that that's appropriate you know we never have a team that's not available to transplant you know we ha we're not we don't just have one surgeon and he goes on vacation we close down for the week you know that we always have you know you know layers of uh, you know layers of the onion to, to be able to do things um you know, we've learned to use organs that in the old days we thought were not good and they turned out they're quite good and we shouldn't have passed on them. We don't use as much in pediatric patients, but there's ways to do this. Um, certainly advocating in the, you know, for pediatric patients in general, you know, in the, in the government and getting priority for kids and things is something that's really fun. You know, a lot of the medicines that are used in adults are used in kids in transplantation. So we have that advantage that, uh, that, you know, and uh, the, the, some of the meds that, that Neil listed earlier are sort of water for us and we don't use them because they're not as effective as our newer agent. So I hope that answers the question, but I'm not sure. It does. Let me, yes, go ahead. Richard. Yeah, let me, um, then I, I think that one thing that we should emphasize is that living donation is something that is uh, available for liver. There are there is ex tremendous expertise to do that. And we have demonstrated that the outcomes of patients receiving a piece of liver from one of the parents is better long-term than the outcome of receiving other the liver from somebody else. I think that it might have to do immunologically, they have less rejection. And yeah, we don't do living donor for intestine here. It has been done in the past. Um, but the reality is for somebody that needs just an isolated, there are different categories of intestinal graft. You can give, and it depends on the patient needs. We don't choose just by chance. Depending on the patient disease, a patient might just need a piece of intestine, the intestine, which is the large, and then a piece of the large and the small intestine. If the patient has a liver disease, if the liver has been damaged because of PPN or other problems, sometimes the patient receives a liver and the intestine. Um, but sometimes we go with a multivisceral. The multivisceral is the whole thing. Eh? You kind of remove most of the abdominal viscera and give it back to the patient from the um, donor. And that will be stomach, liver, intestine, pancreas, and part of the colon. 
And then sometimes we do something that is, that is modified multivisceral, which include only all those organs except the liver, because the liver is healthy. And I think that one of the limiting factors of getting organs is the liver. Only about 100 intestinal transplant patients take place in the United States every year. Then with enormous amount of donor pools, there is no scarcity of intestinal transplant. Mm. The problem comes when you need a liver. When you need a liver, there are many other people with liver disease competing for that liver. And there are, there are people that have tried to living donor intestinal transplant with a piece of intestine. And actually there is a group in Europe now that have, uh, that they try to give a piece of the, of the liver and the piece of the intestine from the same parents to the children. And this is something that we might be interested in doing here, but we really don't need to because the liver is the limiting factor. And we have been very lucky to get all the organs that we need for our patients. Interesting. So I came across a term here while we were uh, sort of talking about uh, this panel that, I'm, uh, that I wasn't familiar with. And maybe you guys can uh, uh, illuminate this. Um, and it might be something that uh, avoids transplantation, intestinal rehabilitation. I've heard about a lot of rehab programs, but uh, how, what, what's intestinal rehabilitation? Well, uh, this is um, a, a therapy. It's a, a, I would say a life-saving treatment, a treatment that is given to patients with intestinal failure. As we have been talking here, intestinal failure is when your intestine, your intestinal system is incapable of, of absorb or move or, or, or doesn't have the length to, to provide you with the amount of nutrients that you need. It could be um, the macronutrients that we know, it could be fluids, it could be vitamins. But we know that, and this intestinal rehabilitation happens mainly with patients that have a big intestinal resection. We have, we are born with a lot of extra intestine. Then if we get resected half of the small bowel, we still can live. But sometimes there is a limitation or the, at the very beginning when that surgery happened, the intestine needs to adapt. And for that adaptation, you might need support of nutritional or parenteral nutrition um, for many years or for many months. Then having an expertise of a team that can provide that parenteral nutrition, uh, preventing to damage the liver, because parenteral nutrition is great, but it can cause liver damage, it can cause other problems. You need a very special IV to get that, a central line, and you have only about four places in your body where you can get that line placed. Then if you start getting infections and your line gets removed, you might be losing access. And all those things are the ones that bring you to needing an intestinal transplant. But if you are cared by a group of experts, multidisciplinary approach again, um, that doesn't exist everywhere in every center because it's kind of costly to have this kind of multidisciplinary teams. If you are cared by one of these multidisciplinary teams, you will have better chance to prevent liver disease to prevent uh, the lack of vascular access and a longer chance to be able to become parenteral enteral sufficient again and being able to be win off the TPN. Then being at a multidisciplinary center with a multi uh, with an intestinal rehabilitation team give you uh, a better chance of not needing an intestinal transplant. And I really think that this is why we are doing less and less of intestinal transplant, because we have become much better about managing this patient. There are new parenteral uh, nutrition solutions, mainly the intralipics that we know that are the one that has been quite toxic to the liver. There has been a development of new of these um, uh, 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 solutions. And also having that multidisciplinary approach. And I have to tell you, as a pediatrician, we always feel like we are following the adults Actually, in intestinal rehabilitation, the pediatricians are leading because intestinal failure is more frequent happening in pediatric in children. And when you look at the number of intestinal transplant, despite our success, the majority number of the intestinal transplant that happens in the United States happen in children because the, the conditions are more like in the newborn period or neonatal conditions. Hmm. So some of what you were just talking about there uh, seems to overlap a little bit with something uh, a term that was brought up a little bit earlier, uh, and that's the uh, ubiquitous uh, microbiome um, that everybody talks about and nobody really can uh, define for me. Um, 
let's talk about what it is, but more importantly, is there a way to restore and maintain a healthy intestinal uh, biome or microbiome that would have any sort of impact on IBD? Okay, I want to, I'll, I'll take this on at least for part, right? Mercedes has talked about a very severe group when we talk about intestinal rehabilitation. There's not enough intestine there or it's borderline. There. Historically, intestinal rehabilitation also applied um, at its least um, troublesome way in children who have an acute viral illness and who have damaged their entire intestine and may take days or weeks or sometimes months to get better. So our focus was, well, what makes the intestinal lining work? What the, and, and that's the key question. If you don't have the lining, then we need Mercedes to, put it, to give us the intestine. But if we have lining that's not working well, we have to figure out why is it not working well, what we can do to fix it. Sometimes it's allergy, sometimes it's inflammatory bowel disease, but more and more and more that word microbiome figures into this. Some of the intestinal damage, whether it is inflammatory bowel disease or other immune mediated diseases relates to how the individual's immune system responded to the micro to the germs that are in the intestine. The microbiome, intestinal microbiome means all living uh, all the living bugs that are in the intestine, including viruses, it's uh, the virome and um, that is the uh, uh, all sorts of ohms that uh, occur there. So the issue that comes down, a lot of our patients say, and a lot of our physicians say, well, here are probiotics, here are pre-probiotics, all these other things. Can we give them? Do they work? The short answer is one day we're going to be really smart and we're going to be able to die and we're going to be able to say for you, you're going to take what's in this bottle. And I believe this very seriously. You're going to take these bugs and they're going to make you better. But for you, with the same issue, you're going to have to take these bugs. This is not pie in the sky. There are more and more papers appearing that are looking at the individual's immune response to the germs that are in their intestine. There are some germs that seem to show up more often than not in sick individuals, but it's not consistent. Um, so those bugs that seem to be associated with healthy outcomes or good results tend to, you know, we, we get really excited about. Those that we keep encountering at bad times because the inflammatory bowel disease is out of control or uh, we're not making progress on rehabilitating the intestine for whatever reason, you know, we, we want to minimize. But we don't know very much about how to do that. Um, this is cutting edge stuff. This is really exciting. 20, 30, 40 years from now, those of us who look at immune mediated diseases in the test, um, they're going to be people who are going to, uh, we're going to look back at what we're doing now and we're going to say, gee, you know, how primitive, how primitive. But um, it's not ready for prime time yet. That's the bottom line. The only thing I would oh, sorry, on the, Similar to the way that we're developing better understanding of the molecular pathways that are involved in inflammatory bowel disease and using a, a true molecular phenotype. We're not there yet, but pediatrics and the pediatric population is what's giving us the greatest insights. And having some of these different biologic agents working better for one child versus another is giving us insights into, well, it might be about the immune pathway that actually is what we're focusing on, not Crohn's versus ulcerative colitis. In the intestine, in the microbiome, there are likely pathways and signatures that we're going to be able to phenotype appropriately in order to develop therapeutics. So it's a rapidly evolving area. Um, the thing that we can do now, um, and we know a lot about now, is um, how do we feed what's in our intestine? So our diets do have a major role in the way that our microbiomes function and how they interact with the intestine. And we have learned some insights there um, that there are some important things that we can do with our own diets um, that can help with uh, the potential of making inflammation worse. It's not enough for us to use this as a true um, therapeutic option, but in a lot of ways, it can be an adjunctive or helping strategy, uh, especially in inflammatory bowel disease. And there are some forms where some children actually can benefit from dietary therapy. Um, and we think a lot of it has to do with the manipulation of what's going on in the microbiome and how that instigates the inflammation in the underlying intestine. 
I'd like to tell you something there. I would like to add something. So I want to talk a little bit about prevention. So, you know, we're not infected by our bacteria in our gut, right? We're symbiotic with our bacteria. So avoiding the indiscriminate use of antibiotics for every runny nose and things that kills down the biome is probably as helpful as trying to replace what we did. So I think as a preventative measure, you know, the, the, the you know, judicious use of antibiotics when it's appropriate and not, you know, to avoid it when it's not appropriate, I think is critical. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I want to move on to the <clears throat> elephant in the room, but first, Neil, we need to come up with another term other than jerk, other than bugs, for the parents. Okay, I'm not sure that they're going to respond well to that. All right, let's talk. The elephant in the room here that I think right now everybody has sort of in the back of their head is COVID, the coronavirus. Let's talk first of all. Is that having any sort? Does that have any sort of impact, direct or otherwise, on IBD at this point? What have you seen? The good news, and I'm a joke comment after I do, but the good, you know, the bad news was COVID. It came, and we didn't know what to expect, and it impacted many of our treatments only because we didn't know. So we tried to stay away from some of these agents that affect the immune system. But over the course of the last couple of years, sadly, we uh, happily or sadly, we have learned that um, most of our patients do well, that, that many of our fears, worst fears were unfounded. And um, COVID seems to have had a relatively uh, small impact. I think it'll take some time before we get really broad-based studies and that may amend my thinking. But right now, um, when it comes to our IBD patients, uh, we generally are treating them as if now we're treating them as if COVID was not a major factor. But interestingly enough, it impacts the treatment because uh, there are times when I would want to bring a child into the hospital for a repeat endoscopy, and you want to keep them away from the hospital. So it was, you say, well, instead of doing it at uh, 12 months, we'll try it at 18, and other things like that, which are also significant. But we seem, it appears as though most of the medical treatments that we use in IBD can and should be used uh, even in this environment. Joe, you want to comment? Yeah, I was going to ask though, but do kids with COVID sometimes present in a way that can be mistaken for for IBD or liver disease? Yes, yeah, so I can I can jump on that and then I'll really dig into the, the liver side of this. So um, you can have an inflammatory component that affects the GI system uh, with both an acute infection of COVID and then also in some post-infectious um, states uh, from COVID. Um, but by and large, what we're seeing and what I think is really important for um, every uh, primary care doctor or any, any, any provider that, that, that meets a, a family, um, like many other acute illnesses, uh, COVID can be the precipitating event that then sets in motion what then leads to a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. So during these past few years, um, COVID's been sort of the event that, oh, my kid is sick, oh, and then they're not getting better, and then we arrive at a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease. And for uh, a while, we were trying to sort through, is this something novel about the virus itself that is increasing rates of intestinal inflammation? And we're still trying to figure out if, if that's the case. I think right now, the vast majority of it is um, there's an acute illness, it triggers this immune response. This was a child that was going to get Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis at some point in their life. And COVID was the thing that just set it in motion, whether it was attention to it or triggering the immune system to, to present itself. So since there is so much interaction there with the, with the immune system, should children with IBD get vaccinated? Is that going to have any impact one way or the other? Um, they should get vaccinated. Short answer, good. Without IBD. Um, and what about if they have um, any special precautions then for uh, when it comes to COVID and, and, and IBD, or is it pretty much the same as it would be for any other child? I'll let others comment, but from my perspective, I think all the children should have a certain, should be practicing the same level of caution and uh, a mixture of common sense and some uh, extra caution, uh, whether they have inflammatory bowel disease or not. And if we were all doing that, then I wouldn't be worried particularly about our IBD patients. 
So in the in the liver world, a um, couple of things. We were, you know, COVID luckily has usually has relatively mild effects on the liver. You know, so a mild hepatitis that's transient. Certainly, there are is a spectrum of disease, and has been much more severe liver disease, even acute liver failure associated with COVID, or you know, something uh, known as MIS-C, which is a multi-inflammatory sy system uh, syndrome where the liver gets affected and can have uh, very, uh, a very aggressive hepatitis, which again, usually resolves, you know, without long-term sequelae. Uh, Dr. Martinez and I, you know, uh, were concerned about, you know, immunosuppression and patients immunosuppressed, either small bowel or liver or both, you know, uh, getting severe COVID. Right, that if they don't get vaccinated, or even if they get vaccinated, since we know you can get it, that these patients would be so we uh, would be adversely affected. So we put together with a couple of our colleagues from uh, from Canada and uh, and from uh, from the uh, West Coast uh, a registry of of patients that that either had chronic liver disease and or transplantation, and collected the information regarding regarding what's happened to them with COVID infection, and 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 fortunately. It seems that there may be actually something protective about immunosuppression that people don't get the exaggerated inflammatory response in the lung. Uh, you know, so uh, we haven't seen the transplant patients be as sick as, we, and uh, you know, so we haven't reduced immunosuppression unnecessarily, actually launching them into rejection or another issue. Uh, so I think you know the registry was an international registry really helped us understand a little bit better, you know, things that we didn't know going into this. You know, certainly some of the drugs that are being used, you know, again, the liver, you know, heart's just a pump, liver's a kidney's just a filter. You know, the liver has to metabolize a lot of these different agents that uh, were tried in these uh, settings and, uh, and it can adversely affect the liver, you know, without helping the COVID. So. I'm glad one, thing that will, mm -hmm. one thing I'm glad that will, one thing that will, during that, go ahead. One thing that we learned from that register also is that children with advanced liver disease actually are at risk of more severe disease and actually liver decompensation. And many kids that were stable at home and have advanced liver disease when they got COVID, they actually needed a, a transplant. Then it's something to be aware that everybody needs to get a vaccine um, because it's the best way to protect all of us. And when they get COVID, you don't know how they are going to do. Then we have good news, but at the same time, be cautious and make sure that we prevent COVID and vaccine is the right way to go. And people Neil will, has, uh, well, go ahead, Steve, please. There was a concern that giving a vaccine, you're stimulating the immune system to react to something. So will you get rejection and other things? And that's not proven to be a problem. You know, so one of the things that Neil mentioned earlier is, is the hospital's gone, has got, gone through great, you know, strides to make sure people are safe if they do need to come here for procedures. You know, spacing out appointments, using, you know, tele televisits rather than in-person uh, in person appointments, you know, eliminating waiting rooms, having the staff vaccinated and boosted, having the patients tested before they come for procedures. A lot has gone through to, to ensure the safety. So people we do need to bring to the hospital, you know, it's very unusual that they will catch COVID from from coming to the hospital. You know, obviously it needs to be balanced, you know, but uh, we've gone through a lot of, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of effort to make it a safe environment and it's not a risk coming here, you know, uh, and I think, you know, Ali, you, you're involved with the endoscopy suite leadership and such. You know, we've really made an effort on every aspect of the hospital to make this safe. Well, I see that we, uh, we actually are just about out of time here and I wanna be respectful of everyone everyone's time. Um, one, one thing I want to say is that I hope I'm around long enough, uh, Neil, to see all of these advances that you keep promising are coming 40, 50 years from now. Uh, but I think we're doing pretty well so far. Uh, so I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, a really interesting and illuminating and I, and I hope educational uh, panel for everyone. A reminder uh, that the webinar will be on the YouTube channel, uh, Columbia Children's YouTube channel and uh, the website. Uh, and again, I think I speak for all of our panelists when I say get vaccinated, wear a mask, get tested. Thank you all for being with us. Stay healthy. Good night. Thank you, Max. Good night. Thank you very much.